Could you please find your seats? Would be nice. So we can start this important meeting. Dear friends, Mr. Ambassador, State Secretary, it's indeed a great pleasure for the Arndals UCA, the Arndals Week, to welcome you all to this important event. We are very proud that the Arctic Council wants to come to Arndal and the Arndals Week to celebrate the 20th uh, anniversary here together with a lot of friends from Alaska and a lot of friends from the Arctic. Arctic is important to Norway. It's always been important and will always be important. And the Arctic Council is a very important institution for us. But not only for us, for all the eight countries surrounding the Arctic. The Arctic Council is, you know, a, a way that civilization is able to be kept in these important uh, areas of the world. And we have noticed with great interest that all these eight countries are putting all uh, um, increased effort to making Arctic Council an efficient and good organization, which we from Norwegian, Norwegian side is very proud of. And I must say, we are proud that you want to come here to Arndal to, be, to have this big conference that the Mr. Ambassador is coming here, just to have these important talks, how we can move further on. From Arndal Suka, I am very proud that we could collaborate with a lot of important organizations doing this, the Arctic Council, of course, but also the Parliament, because this is an important meeting for us and for you. We welcome you all to Arndal. I hope you have a good time while you're here. The weather is perfect and there's a lot of different important meetings going on also, not only this meeting, so I hope that you will enjoy your stay in Arndal and enjoy the Arndal's week. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all. Please. Hear me? Ah, magic. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. I know we're competing against what might be one of the most beautiful days I have seen from rainy Alaska in many, many weeks. So it's very good of you to be inside with us. We have some distinguished guests here today of all different kinds from many different places, starting with your very own minister. And I just saw him sitting somewhere right in front of me. There he is, um, Minister Tura Hatram. I hope I'm doing that justice in Norwegian. The State Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, is going to speak to us first. And then our wonderful U.S. Ambassador, Sam Hines. I assume you pronounce it Hines like the ketchup. Yes. yes. <laughs> so we'll hear from the two diplomats. Uh, the important thing to note today is that we are all here celebrating the phenomenal 20th anniversary of the formation of the Arctic Council which those of us in this room probably know is one of the more extraordinarily unheralded and yet very successful to date governmental entities on our planet Earth. And we are all here to attempt to keep it that way, along with the person-to-person -person and nation-to-nation -nation cooperation that it all represents. So with that in mind, Minister, I'll turn the podium over to you and then to our U.S. Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Alice, and, and thank you for upgrading me to minister. But, uh, I'm deputy minister, but... Uh, but are, you... aren't you referred to as minister when the, your boss is not in the room? Of course, of course. I've thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ambassador, Senator, uh, distinguished guests, uh, as you said, this marks two decades of successful cooperation in the Arctic Council, and I think we have achieved a lot. In a world which resembles a turbulent sea, the Arctic is like a tranquil island where international law and order prevail. And this is very much 
an accomplishment of the Arctic states and the Arctic Council, and we have much to celebrate. And we are impressed and pleased with the American chairmanship in the Arctic Council. Norway and the US share the same priorities and have a very close cooperation in the Council. Intergovernmental cooperation in the Arctic is based on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And this constitution of the oceans provides a clear legal framework for uses of oceans and seas. New rules are being developed in line with growing needs and within the framework of international law. The Arctic Council initiated negotiations that have resulted in binding agreements between the eight Arctic states on search and rescue, as well as on oil spill preparedness and response. And more is to come. In June, the delegates to an Arctic Council meeting agreed to a text on closer scientific cooperation between the Arctic states. Although the agreement won't be final until it is signed by the Arctic Council Ministerial in spring 2017, it is widely expected to go ahead. And this will be the third legally binding agreement initiated by the Arctic Council and represent a big and important step for the Council. Where do we see the Arctic Council 20 years from now? It is our vision that the Arctic states will cooperate closely in laying the foundation for responsible economic development, green innovation, and blue growth. Thus, Norway was pleased when the Arctic Council took the initiative to create the Arctic Economic Council. I said this to Tara Sweeney before, but let me just reiterate how pleased Norway is with your work as chair of the Arctic Economic Council. Norway has high ambitions for the Arctic Economic Council. We hope it will play an important role in setting up a robust regime based on knowledge and innovation for industry cooperation in the Arctic. And we welcome a stronger cooperation with Alaska on Arctic challenges and opportunities. Both Norway and Alaska aim to promote sustainable business development in the North. His Majesty King Harald and Foreign Minister Brenda visited Alaska last year. And I'm happy to see such a strong participation from Alaska at this year's conference in Arendal. Both Alaskans and Norwegians are people of the North. The knowledge and experience of the people in Alaska is vital in shaping U.S. policy on the Arctic, including in the Arctic Council. And I really look forward to the discussions this afternoon, and thank you very much for your attention. And it gives me great pleasure to ask Ambassador Hines to come up. And Ambassador, I, I mean this with all due respect and great affection. I'm looking forward to hearing if you discuss the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, how you discuss it. Thank you. Well, that was a tricky introduction. <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed, too. <laughs> you're going to avoid it. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Haas, and State Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as you know, our Secretary of State and the President are keenly interested in the Arctic and the environment. Uh, the President was in Alaska. I think he was the first President to uh, make a trip of that sort. And our Secretary of State uh, had a trip to Norway, which took him uh, to, the, to the high north. We had a rather spectacular day in Langyrbyen and Neolis. And um, these are issues of profound importance uh, to the leaders of the United States. And it's a great pleasure for me to be able to uh, be here.
to discuss uh, our interest. As you know, the uh, Admiral Papp has been the special envoy for uh, the Arctic Council. I think he's done a superb job, highly qualified and very articulate, uh, and a builder of consensus in important ways. What I'd like to do is simply uh, point out three achievements. The State Secretary has referred to some of them. Uh, and then uh, take a look at what we hope will be the immediate future for the Arctic Council. The Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, uh, which was alluded to, we think is a particularly important practical achievement of the Arctic Council, uh, all of the countries working together. The Oil Spill Response Agreement, likewise, uh, of tremendous importance uh, environmentally and otherwise, and as a building block towards the kind of cooperation that we all seek uh, in the Arctic. And the third real accomplishment is more uh, programmatic than, uh, um, than policy, and that is the fact that over the years of the Arctic Council's functioning, it has uh, evolved consensus-driven policies and a measure of cooperation which is uh, in some ways uh, happily divorced from some of the divisions and the unhappiness uh, between the members of the council when they get together in other contexts. Uh, for the future, uh, the Arctic uh, Science Cooperation Agreement we think will be a significant achievement when it is uh, executed as we believe it will be in the spring of 2017. Uh, we think, uh, from our perspective, that long-term planning is a key to the future success of the Arctic Council, uh, moving beyond the two-year chairmanship uh, duration. And we think that there is general consensus that that kind of long-term planning should be uh, put in place. And finally, we look forward to a smooth transition in chairmanships. It's obviously important uh, in an international cooperative body of this sort to have a smooth handoff. I know that Admiral Papp has uh, already been in consultation with uh, his Finnish colleagues, and I think that uh, we can look forward to a smooth transition uh, in 2017. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, while I'm presenting myself, I will ask the Ambassador and the State Secretary to please take a seat on, on, on the stage so we could have a little chat about what you just have said. My name is uh, Ture. Ture, please take a seat. <laughs> they don't take command, these State Secretaries. My name is Arne Uholm. Um, I'm the editor of the High North News at the High North Center for Business and Governance at Nord University in Buda. Together with my friend Alice Rogov, she needs an introduction herself, lives in Anchorage, is a publisher of a newspaper called Alaskan Dispatch. So we are a kind of a concrete example of what we are discussing today, co cooperation between Alaska and Norway. And the reason we are very happy that the Arndals Week made it possible for us to have the discussion here is that our job is to give a voice to the North, but we want to move that voice out to show how national and international the High North and the Arctic are, and the Arndals Week is a possibility to do that. And that's why we have invited Alaskan friends, people from the United States, and a lot of, of Norwegian people as well. So we're gonna have no, you met a state secretary in the foreign department. You met the U.S. ambassador in Norway. I'm going to give you now some of the more local politicians. And when we have chatted a little bit, we also give you five business people. So we bring it all together to discussion of the importance of cooperation, how we could be concrete, and why. 
at all should we cooperate between the United States and Norway? And how, why is Arctic Council so important? But Mr. Ambassador, if I may ask you, I mean, if, if I'm well informed, which I hope I am, Mr. Obama was the first president visiting Alaska as the president, is that right? That's my understanding, yes. I mean, in Norway, we get ministers and prime minister and state secretary all the time running to the north. Why, why, what does it say about the American high north politics that this is the first time ever that the president visit Alaska? Well, I think it's a manifestation of the importance that President Obama attaches to Arctic issues and to the environment and to the fact of global warming. And one of the uh, political realities that we uh, confront in the U.S. is that there are still an increasingly small minority of people who uh, are global warming deniers. And so the raising the, the understanding of the science and the awareness of the issues and the importance of the issues are very important to this administration, and I think the, the president's actions in that regard uh, were very positive and I know appreciated by the, uh, the people in Alaska who are very active in these issues and by people in Norway and elsewhere who are very concerned. You are referring to, to climate issues. Is that also a strategic interest in when, when, I, when I visit Alaska these days? Well, I suppose wherever he goes, there's a strategic interest. There's always... Uh, has, that, has that increased the last couple of years? Well, I think it's very hard for me to say what, uh, whether the strategic interest uh, has gone up or down. Um, obviously, there are tensions in the world today that were not the tensions of two or three or four or eight years ago. Uh, whether they're more or less, I think, is probably not something that I'm equipped to evaluate. Tore uh, Hotrem, your government said that uh, the High North is the most strategic, important area in Norway. Why is that? Well, the, the difference between Norway and many other uh, Arctic countries is actually that there are a living, substantial number of Norwegians are living in the North, and, uh, and it's all about 10% of the population. And in addition to that, we, there is an increasing awareness that the future opportunities for Norway you know, lies, in a sense, in the north uh, and in the sea. And, uh, and uh, our, our sea areas are many times bigger than our land areas. And I think that uh, politicians and, and people understand that, for us, there is a very important and, and interesting and challenging economic future. Mm -hmm. For that to be realized, in a sense, if you're going to tap that potential, we need to have uh, infrastructure investments, we have to, to increase in higher education, we have to uh, invest in research to be able to tap those resources in the future. And I think it's a bipartisan understanding, a bipartisan support for that. Uh, and this is the government policy. And it's sort of, the, most, the domestic policy uh, goes together with, with, uh, with foreign policy in the sense that our interest stretches you know, beyond our, our territory also into the Arctic areas of our neighbors. So the importance of cooperating in the Arctic Council, cooperating with our neighbors so that we have a, um, a uh, working conditions and an infrastructure of cooperation where we actually are able to tap these, uh, these resources. So, so what you are saying is actually that um, the high north, the northern part of Norway, is getting a more important economic role for the whole nation. Yeah, is that right? I think that's, uh, that's fair to say. Uh, you're starting to see that now, and that's something you can see in the sense that the, uh, in the last couple of years, the, uh, the, uh, the economic growth in the northern, in the three northernmost uh, counties have been relatively higher than the average for Norway. And I think that is a trend that we will continue seeing in the future uh, as we are being able to, to, uh, to, uh, to exploit the resources. At the same time, we also realize that this needs to be done in a sustainable way. You know, there needs to be a compromise uh, between 
uh, economic development and, and, and environment, and that's what we call sustainable development. And that's a perspective we share with, uh, with the Americans and certainly all uh, the, the Alaskans. Mm -hmm. We, we have people living in the north, and there probably will be a relatively higher share of the population will live in, in northern Norway in the future. And we have to have jobs up there. There needs to be potential for people actually living there, you know, creating their lives, having families. Does that also mean that um, the economic growth will mean more public investment in like infrastructure? and Which is like happening. That. that is exactly what the government is doing through its... Uh, it's Nordområde uh, satsing, or uh, what you call the, uh, the, uh, the emphasis on, on developing the north. It is actually to ensure that we have a higher public investment level for these three counties than what is the average for the other countries. You look at, in, uh, at, uh, at roads and transport, 20% uh, of the investments are going to, uh, to the, uh, the three counties in the north, uh, representing 10% of the population. Uh, you see the same with, uh, with higher education, and, and now we're trying to push also uh, research. And I think that is, is, uh, is a deliberate uh, effort, and a de deliberate policy to ensure that, uh, that uh, that is not what we need to do in the future. And we have a budget policy to make sure that this is happening. Heinz, when you listen to, uh, to Tore Hotrem, is there any similarity at all between the Northern Norway's part of the Norwegian economy and Alaska's economy uh, in America? Well, I think so. I mean, I, the uh, sustainable development of resources is something that is a key priority of uh, the Obama administration. Um, in terms of the relative importance to the national economy, obviously, Alaska is to the lower 48, um, rather different in proportion, I think, than the northern part of Norway and Svalbard are to the, to the rest of Norway. So in, in that sense, dissimilar, but... Okay, thank you so size. far. We'll get back to you. And now I would like to invite um, more local politicians. And we start with um, Eric Sieversen, a member of, uh, of the parliament, uh, representing... representing Nordland Bode, please, Erik Sivertsen. Thank you, Your Excellency, State Secretary. Dear friends of the Arctic, let me start by saying congratulations to us all, because I mean the uh, uh, Arctic Cooperation and the cooperation in the Arctic Council has been a success. It has developed into an international regional organization, which we all know by its peaceful and constructive members, an innovative governance and involvement of the indigenous people living in the Arctic. This is new, and this is good, and it should be an inspiration for a lot of other international organizations. The Arctic cooperation reflects the uniqueness of the region in a good way. In a few years, the Arctic Council has developed into, um, into an organization changing with, with the challenges it face. And I will emphasize the strength which li uh, lies in that we have, uh, or the Council has involved the indigenous people already from the, the start. Base its decisions on science and local uh, uh, and traditional knowledge about the region. Starting as an uh, environmental cooperation, it has taken on new areas of cooperation, such as shipping, human health, and more recently, economic development. As an example, the creation of the Arctic Economic Council, which is a very important contributor to further development. To ensure that local communities will benefit from economic development, capacity building, particularly through education, it's deci uh, is decisive. It is, however, vital that capacity development is rooted in and relevant, uh, uh, relevant for the people living in the region, and there is a link between the economic opportunities and the education system. The UN and other forums have focused on interplay between businesses, uh, uh, business development and human rights, resulting in initiatives such as the UN Global uh, Impact uh, Initiative, 
In January this year, we uh, saw an Arctic investment protocol which was presented in the World Economic Forum. I believe governments and businesses operating in the Arctic should use these existing international CS, uh, corporate social uh, responsibility guidelines and fi find ways to implement them in the Arctic to the good for the people living in the Arctic uh, and will be uh, touched by the uh, activities there. To explore the potential of voluntary mechanism to encourage high industry standards in social and environmental performance, such as highlighting uh, best performances uh, in Arctic corporate, uh, Arctic corporate Responsibility Index, based on instance, as I mentioned, the Arctic Business Investment Protocol and the UN Global Compact Initiative, or other tools which uh, could apply. I think it's a challenge to include more voices from people living in the Arctic, such as regional uh, organization, into the work of the future, uh, into the future work of the Arctic Council, to, uh, to ensure that they, the people living there can influence their direction uh, uh, in the Arctic cooperation. There has been, through the two decades since the forming of the Arctic Council, a lot of important decisions and right decisions who has been, which has been made in Moscow, in Washington, in Oslo, in Copenhagen and other places. But the time has come to, in better ways, to ensure that the people living in the region can themselves contribute in a stronger degree to the uh, choices for, for the future. And I have one challenge for the Arctic Council which I would like the Arctic Council to uh, uh, take a leading role into. If you count for the eight Arctic states and the 12 observer nations, and then I include the EU without taking up the discussion about the formal uh, status, they count for more than <coughs> two thirds of the global CO2 emissions. This is the biggest challenge humankind are meeting at the time. We reached a very important international deal in Paris last year on the goal for reducing uh, the emissions. But we haven't yet found the way to reach the goals. And it's hard to get 200 countries to find together on, uh, on uh, solving this problem and find the right ways. But the people living in the Arctic are, in broad terms, the people which first will be hit by the consequences of the climate crisis, and we will be hit double as hard as the uh, average of the world. Therefore, I challenge the Arctic Council in the next 20 years to take a leading role in finding the instruments to solve the international climate crisis between the eight Arctic member states and the 12 observer uh, nations and eventually uh, more observers uh, to come. That's the challenge and my wish uh, for the next uh, 20 years. Thank you for the, your attention. Thank you very much, Eric. I, I have to ask you actually, when you have this suggestion, what Arctic Council could do to the climate changes, what kind of power do you want to put into Arctic Council actually? Well, I think we are. There has been a discussion, should the Arctic Council be a fully-fledged international body or should it continue as a um, cooperation based on consensus? I think it's it is wise, and I have changed my mind over the years, but I think today that it's wise that the Arctic Council continue as a consensus uh, uh, body, which the members uh, argue and work hard to reach uh, consensus. But my point is that these nations representing the people which will be hit hardest and first by the climate crisis have a possibility and a responsibility for taking a lead role in how we solve the climate crisis or the consequences of uh, the emissions uh, the humankind has for the moment. Okay, so but still by consensus, not by... Uh, yeah, but I think uh, the power in uh, going in the front as a good example uh, is underestimated uh, in the di daily life. 
Thank you very much, Eric. It's a pleasure. The next speaker I traveled all the way from Alaska. Uh, I, I'm very proud to introduce from you a U.S. Senator, Lesel McGuire, an American Alaskan politician. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here um, as a part of your program for Arnold Week, an honor. Um, and so I bring greetings from all the Alaskans here. There's a group of us that have flown in um, to make more connections with people in your country. Um, appreciate the hospitality. My family and many Alaskan families actually um, are immigrants from Norway. And um, so I was just gonna bring that up when I started. <clears throat> On my father's side, his uh, mother was second generation American through the St. Lawrence River last name Knock and Moose. Um, and so there are many ties that, that our countries have in the North. I'd just like to invite you to consider that the Arctic is more than climate change. And I think that has been the center of, of discussion around the Arctic for so many of the last uh, couple of years. When people are first finding out about the Arctic, they find out about it through the lens of climate change. It's more than ice, it's more than tundra, it's more than sea mammals, it's people. The Arctic is, is us. And I'm here today to give you a, a face. Other of my colleagues are as well. It's true that we are some of the world's first climate change refugees. And so we do talk about climate change and it's an important part of how we live and how we approach development uh, in the Arctic. But I invite you to consider in the future, as you look at the Arctic and think about it, that you always come back to the people first. Those of us that, that live there, that work there, that raise our families there, and that want to continue living there. In my state, Alaska, we are what makes the United States an Arctic nation. And as you know, my country has had the honor of chairing the Arctic Council for the past two years. Um, we followed Canada, and next comes Finland. Um, in many cases, citizens of the United States are just finding out that we're an Arctic nation. And again, I mentioned largely through the lens of climate change, but that's been our challenge in my state, is getting the United States to finally recognize we are in fact a United States, and we make the United States um, uniquely an Arctic nation. We have many challenges in the Arctic, challenges that, that we share, all of us together. The Arctic is cold. It is remote, it is sparsely populated, and those populations are spread out over vast geographical di distances. In my state, um, many of those locations cannot be reached or bridged without uh, an aircraft. And, and there's very little infrastructure. And I think that's a theme that you'll hear all, all of us talking about today. That lack of infrastructure, of course, presents challenges in terms of safety. A lack of hospitals, lack of bandwidth, lack of ports, uh, and proper uh, opportunities to develop jobs and, and resources. Like you, um, we too are also physically and mentally far away from our federal capital. That's another major point that I want to emphasize for you here in the room. Oslo and Washington, D.C. Um, are very far away in their thinking, in many cases, um, from us locals uh, in our state. Involvement of local people at the local, regional, and tribal level is critical. And that's another point that I want to leave you all with here today as you think about the Arctic, how important it is, and it's an honor to have our ambassador here today, and, and an honor to have federal officials, but that the Arctic itself um, and the thoughts about the Arctic should come down to the, to the most local of people, the people who have lived, and in the case of Tara Sweeney, who you'll hear from, um, on, on the land for thousands and thousands of years. Why it's so important, in my opinion, is because it's the local people that have the most interest in keeping the environment sound for their children, for themselves, preserving the place that they live and work, but they also have that healthy respect for the opportunities that are needed to, de to develop healthy communities. And of course, we know that that's an economy. So jobs and access to resource development are an important part of the things that we local people talk about. Without self-worth, without a sense of hope, 
um, our suicide rates in the North continue to climb. They are, are already uh, higher than most places on the earth. Just one statistic to give you, women in Alaska ages 16 to 22 have 10 times the national United States average of suicide rates. And, and just think about that for a second. Before you've even started your life and all of the ups and downs that life brings, you don't even want to begin it. And so when you think about resource development and the balance that we're trying to seek with the environment, please understand it's through that lens of giving the people hope and opportunity. Um, to that end, I want to, um, we have just a little bit to introduce ourselves. I, I want to tell you the effort that I led so that as I'm on the panel today, you understand the lens I, I come through. I'm a lifelong Alaskan. 16 years I served in the House and the Senate. And most recently, I've had the honor of co-chairing the Alaska Arctic Policy Commission. And this was an opportunity for us to come forward as Alaskans to put our values, our ideas on the table in front of our federal government to policy make. And it was a challenge at first. In the spring of 2014, my co-chair and I were in Washington, D.C. and um, meeting with our, our president's team at, at that point. And they were just a couple months away from introducing their strategic Arctic plan for the United States of America. And um, without being too critical, Alaskans had not been at the table and had not been consulted at any real formal way. And so we asked them to hold off their efforts, and they did. They were very gracious, and they followed our work for the two years that it took us to complete uh, our final report. That report is at akarctic.com, since we'll just have a short time to visit here today. But I wanted to mention just a few things about it. The first is the commission was made up of a healthy mix of local elected officials and lay people. I think that's really important when you're looking at Arctic um, policy making as well, that you involve people who are staunch environmental advocates, uh, people who are staunch pro-development advocates, and then people who represent tribes, um, people who represent the art community. So there were 26 of us, we met for two years, we met in the communities themselves. And so to give you an example, we would fly to Barrow. We would listen first. We spent the entire first day listening. Another important part of Arctic policy making is listening. And then we would deliberate on the second day. These are the four policy statements that came out of it. The report is approximately 118 pages, but just a couple of takeaways. The first is that we have a commitment to upholding economically vibrant communities consistent with the responsibility of a healthy environment. The second is that we would collaborate with all levels of government and stakeholders. And our local leaders agreed that it was our responsibility to reach out to the federal officials as well and be sure that they were involved, as well as international leaders. Third, that we should have a secure and safe Arctic. Um, yesterday I was in a meeting where one of the Norwegian presenters said that if he had to sum it up in two words, that he said that Norwegians want a safe and peaceful, or a peaceful and stable Arctic. And I think that that's uh, what Alaskans want too. And finally, that we, va that the value, that we value um, and want to strengthen the resilience of our communities. So um, as, I, as I wrap up, um, I just let you know that we're still working um, through these policies. We have implemented an Arctic infrastructure fund using our state bank, which is designed to help stimulate investment in the infrastructure in the Arctic. We have put the policy into state law itself, but we have four lines of effort that will continue to be worked on. Um, those involve the response to the capacity gap in infrastructure, healthy communities themselves, Alaska-based science and research, and economic development. Um, and so I thank you for your time in my opening remarks, and just, again, a huge thank you to your country. We have a close uh, connection as Northerners, our values, the way that we approach things, and I look forward to working um, with all of you in the future. Thank you very much. Yes, please, take a seat.
It seems like, uh, Michelle, that all of you Americans have Norwegian relatives. Is that right? It's a lot of us. It's a lot of us. Yeah, we have one other guy here who's coming later. He's called Edvardsen. He's from Alaska. Nils Anthony Edvardsen. So you have... Um, I, I, I have to ask you not, not to be rude, even if it feels like I'm rude when I ask this question, because you have an election going on in the United States, and, and one of your candidates from your party, the Republican, is Donald Trump. Could I ask you, as a Republican living in the high north, what do you think about that? So I remember Alice Rogoff, a very wise, wise woman, yesterday said um, at the start of our Arctic meeting, no questions about Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. I... And so I'm going to invoke that. Is that right? Yes. I mean, is, is that a situation? I would say this, that I think what's important about whoever ends up as the next president of the United States, that they work with the transition team um, of the outgoing Obama administration on the Arctic. I think there is really no more prescient issue for us as Northerners. Um, obviously, conflicts in the Middle East and scarcity of resources plague all of us. But the chance to develop uh, this area responsibly mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think you've seen development on the earth um, happen, where you really are involving indigenous people, where you're involving locals, and you're creating that healthy balance between um, protecting the environment and creating opportunity for future generations. I see the Arctic as a place that will help move innovation, help take that next young generation into um, all kinds of exciting opportunities. So whichever of the administrations wins, I think um, an important thing for us here in the room is that they continue to work with the hard work of the Obama administration. Okay, so far about Mr. Donnell. Eric, um, uh, what we hear from Alaska now is, um, yeah, a lot of similarity, but I, I would like you to, um, to analyze the situation where you, I mean, you have a lot of local plans, you have regional plans, uh, strategic plans, and you have wishes, and adapting, the, adapt, adapting them into the national politics. What is your experience in Norway with that? Because we have the same thing in Northern Norway. Yeah. A lot of local plants, regional plants. I know you're a member of the parliament, so you have seen all the way. <laughs> well, I think it's very important to have plants because that's one way of systematizing what are you thinking, what are, uh, are the goals. Uh, so that's an important st starting point. Uh, but it, uh, the short version is it boils down to money. Are you getting the resources to do the necessary investments to, uh, uh, to realize uh, the, the ideas, uh, the plans uh, you, you have. How do we uh, manage to do that uh, at a national uh, level? Because um, one thing about the North in all the uh, eight Arctic countries, I think it's, it, it's a kind of uh, North-South dimension. Uh, where there is a lot of resources uh, in, in the north, but it's, uh, the economies uh, are uh, underdeveloped. Uh, underdeveloped. Uh, there are a lot of potential, but you need, among other things, infrastructure. Uh, you need capacities in, uh, uh, among uh, local authorities, and you need more education and uh, research to uh, get the most out of the resources. And to get there, you have to use some national resources investing in them. I think that in Norway, the 10 last years, we have, uh, have seen a uh, rising interest and willingness to invest in the North. But as a uh, northern myself, of course, I should wish for even more uh, to get the most out of the opportunities uh, we see. I'd like to say something potentially provocative, that if there were a choice between plans, I'm in favor of the regional and local plans first and would ask that the federal funds go toward implementing them. And I'll just give you the example in Alaska. If the federal policy had moved forward without the Alaskans at the <coughs> table, you would have had such surprising gaps um, in, in application. One, one simple thing that I can point to, in June of 2014 in our first meeting in Barrow, we were presented formally with the first draft of the strategic plan, and the word people was not even in the document. Mm. And I just encourage you to think about that. 
And again, this is not casting aspersions. This is, this is identifying that distinction between the sovereign at the national level looking at this place as almost a snow globe, um, as a place where there is climate change only to discuss tundra and ice and so forth. And without that one-on-one -on -one attention that as local leaders and community leaders, we're in the grocery with our neighbors. We're reflecting um, on their needs. And the second example, Tara Sweeney, who will speak, is the chair of the Arctic Economic Council. In the case of the Obama administration, when they proposed how they were moving into the transition, the proposal was to eliminate AEC entirely. And it was only because of my co-chair and I stepping up and saying, absolutely, we need it, because that's where the jobs and the development come from. We, we simply said, we'll take over financially. And so I would say, if you had to choose, pick local and regional. Okay, interesting. Uh, how do you respond to these local analyses here? Well, I don't think they are... Uh excluding each other in a sense. I mean, the, the, uh, as Eric said, you need plans to be able to do something. I'm representing the government. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs' role here is, is, is a kind of coordinating role to make sure that, that the ministry's plans are coherent and that the investment level uh, in the three countries in the north uh, are high. I mean, it's, it's about 2.7 billion Norwegian crones more than what you will get out of the ordinary budget process this year. What we have done in the last year is to, to work with the, at the regional level to try to include also the, the, the county administration and also the political level at the county as a part of what we call the Northern Area Strategy. So obviously we are learning as we move forward. As being said here, capital is extremely important. I mean, for the central government to ensure that infrastructure is built, that is extremely important. But what that also lays the foundation for is uh, profitable future private investment. Some of the problem in Northern Norway has been that the companies are too small and they're not, they don't have sufficient capital to be able to invest. And what we're doing is to, to come up with uh, you know, seed investment money, and to ensure that the, the investment level of the government makes it easier for, for the companies to actually be able to invest in their, to actually earn money. So it's a fairly, you know, very deliberate strategy to, mm -hmm. to maintain the, momen the, the momentum of having actually higher econ economic growth in the future in Northern Norway compared to the rest of the country because the potential are bigger. Okay, what is the political system, how it works? We, we're going to move over to some business people here, but how about the international? Because in both in Northern Norway and Alaska, the international cooperation, national, not a lot of headquarters in the area. How do they respond to local uh, uh, responsibility and strategies? Well, it's, a, it's, it's an emerging area, mm -hmm. and it's an area that um, our local corporations who now joint venture and partner with international corporations are having a lot of success with. And, and what we say um, in Alaska is we, we are value driven. And so that people who want to come and do business in our state, um, we, ex we expect you to identify with those values. But I would say that um, it has been uh, a challenge in many ways. Uh, you look at Shell as, as an example of one international company that came in uh, with leases in the Beaufort and the Chukchi, and I think that they had some growing pains in the first couple of years. Um, they weren't quite sure how to um, uh, approach the indigenous population. Um, maybe one could argue they didn't approach them um, in the first couple of years, and that really hurt them. But once they started to, to understand that getting that community buy-in was so important, you saw them listening. You saw them adjusting their plans. You saw them proposing um, infrastructure assets in the community and so forth. So I think um, we're still navigating this area. Um, at the Arctic Council level, I would just say, because it is a national um, organization, that also can present some challenges because uh, it is the United States and not Alaska. Mm. Eric. Yeah, and the story uh, she's telling, uh, I know from my own part of the country, this is a, a living discussion of 
how do you involve with the local communities? How do you let people have benefits from uh, the operations uh, you have? Financial, by creating jobs, by letting local enterprises taking part in technology development, research, uh, to uh, ensure a higher quality uh, and uh, better chances for surviving in, in the competition. Uh, this is... Uh, it's different from company to, to company, but I think, as I said in my, my speech, I think we should um, have higher requirements for uh, com companies moving into small co communities with limited capacity. Uh, I think that is a common circumpolar challenge we have to meet. Thank you very much. We're moving ahead um, towards the business people. And Alice, I think I need your help now. We're going to get a bunch of people on the stage here. Is somebody going to keep control over them? I don't know if you want to try these guys over here and take a chair there, or you want to fight with these business people. I think yeah. I'd like to call on the business people and then turn the subject from policy to putting investment thoughts into practice. We all have had the pleasure uh, in small groups of talking about how we can do some knowledge exchange uh, thoughtful exchange, student exchange, and we really have to get beyond that to some tangible steps. So, if you're okay, Arnie, let's just call up Tara Sweeney. Tara wears many hats, but the one that I'd like her to speak from today is not the Arctic Economic Council hat, but her hat at Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. Tara has probably the biggest uh, international view of Arctic business as it exists today, outside of Russia at least, in the circumpolar Arctic. And I'd be very interested to know, when you're done being chair of the Arctic Economic Council and you're back to just being an Arctic Slope executive with big vision, how you could see that we might actually begin to do business together, country to country. Sorry. Just right here. Well, good afternoon. Uh, as Alice said, my name is Tara Sweeney. I am an Inupiaq from Barrow, Alaska. And I see uh, a number of people from my hometown in the audience. Hi, Delbert. Hi, Lars. Uh, hi, Carlin and Anthony, my uncle. Uh, we're all related somehow, and Anthony will share with you how he's related to Norway and his ties. Uh, I'm the Executive Vice President of External Affairs for Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, and we are the largest Alaskan-owned company in the state, uh, approximately uh, $2.6 billion in revenue uh, in 2015. We have 10,000 employees nationwide. Uh, there are six sectors uh, that, that we operate in, the energy support services sector, industrial services, construction, government services, resource development, and petroleum refining and marketing. I also serve as the chair of the Arctic Economic Council. Uh, we have eight Arctic states as members and six Arctic indigenous organizations. The board is a 42-member board, and the vision of the Arctic Economic Council is to make the Arctic a favorable place to do business. Uh, we're open for business, uh, and uh, our membership is uh, open for application. And uh, here, I would like to point out Anu Fredrickson, who is the director of the Secretariat. If you have any questions or want some additional information, she's here as well. Uh, when you look at Alaska and Norway, uh, we have some challenges, uh, similar challenges, large land masses, uh, remote communities, high cost of living, high cost of energy in some areas, uh, extreme weather conditions, uh, the need for infrastructure development and investment, and we have areas that are developed, developing, or underdeveloped in regions uh, in our state and in your country. Uh, 
But we also have some similarities. Uh, oil and gas development, maritime transportation, concentration, uh, commitment to science and to research, commercial and subsistence harvests of seafood and terrestrial mammals, and then resource management. We talked yesterday, uh, Stella, we, we talked about resource management in the the uh, capacity as having the ability to manage our natural resources, our uh, commercial harvest of fish uh, in a very prudent and disciplined way. Uh, when asked to speak this afternoon about how Alaska and Norway uh, can cooperate to define successful models to the north, I really put a lot of thought into this uh, question. And at first I thought it was fairly simple, but as I pondered this question, uh, it became clear to me that the answer is more complex and probably as unconventional as American politics today. <laughs> Uh, historically, we have left the bridge building across borders to our governments. And as the globe shrinks and the world looks north, uh, it, it will take an unconventional approach to cooperation to build successful models for growth. Uh, successful cooperation between Norway and Alaska rests, in my opinion, on four underlying principles. Uh, the first is trust, and in Alaska, you build trust by sharing a meal together. This goes beyond the, the round tables, this goes beyond uh, conferences, it's by sharing a meal and getting to know the person across the table. And we've had a great time this week doing just that with so many people in the audience, and Lars, thank you very much. Through this process, we begin to understand what works and what doesn't work in our societies. And establishing trust is a keystone to that success. And once we pass that threshold, real progress begins. As the chair of the AEC and as, uh, as the executive vice president for Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, I, I can say that I do believe that the AEC is the appropriate uh, fora to build this trust. The second underlying principle is commitment. Uh, two types of commitments are needed. The first is a commitment within industry to build relationships, understand the business culture and climate of their industry counterpart, and strategy development and execution. The second commitment is by our governments to publicly acknowledge assist and embrace the relationships between Norway and Alaska. We've become over-reliant on our government representatives to do all of the heavy lifting. The time has come for Norwegian businesses and Alaskan businesses and business leaders to roll up our sleeves and become part of the solution, serving as a partner to our government representatives in this endeavor. The third principle, is an unconventional approach, which I call piggybacking. Uh, Norway and Alaska have been hit hard by global oil prices, and in this time of tra transition, gone are the days of lavish spending and exclusivity. We have to do more with less, which makes heightened cooperation ripe for our Arctic states. It is important that we maximize our time and our opportunities, and this can be done by combining several events in succession, whereby we piggyback with one another. For example, when the Arctic Economic Council uh, hosts its 2017 annual meeting in Fairbanks, we're deliberating whether there is value in collaborating with other like-minded organizations, let's say, uh, like the Arctic Business Council. This could bring together two Arctic organizations which could engage in dialogue and problem solving. Finally, the fourth principle is silo. Actually, moreover, breaking down those silos within our borders and amongst our countries. Again, gone are the days of pride and ownership. 
It is essential that for our two Arctic states to become successful, we must rise above territorialism and break down those silos. Let us identify, and Alice, you, you wanted to know what my recommendation is. Let us identify a handful of sectors common to Norway and Alaska and put together clusters of thought leaders from the private, the academic, scientific, and government sectors to come up with successful models that we can both embrace. And while it may seem unconventional on its face, it really is quite simple. We must have the will to succeed. In September 2015, I had the honor of standing with Foreign Minister Borga Brende uh, to raise the AEC flag in Tromsø. And it was at that event he said, if we, are going to, if we are going to make the high north our most innovative region, we are dependent upon cooperation with others. So I stand before you today in conclusion with a call to action. On behalf of Arctic Slope Regional Corporation and, the chair, and as the chair of the AEC, I extend to you the hands of commitment to success for Norway and Alaska. And I ask that you join us in partnership to break the mold and create a new model for success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. We have a few more speakers left, and there's so much we want to cover. I'm going to ask you to try and keep your remarks short so we have time for a little bit of group interaction. Uh, Mead Treadwell, who has been sick, is, I think, out of town now, headed somewhere where I hope he gets more rest. So I'm going to ask Felix to come up, Felix Schutte, who I think needs no introduction to most of you. But I think, uh, Alice, we, because we have to be out of this scene at the same have... time. So we invite all the guests up, I think. Felix, Judy. But, but let's, Felix, ask you to give a, just a few remarks, and then each of you, in turn, briefly, so we yeah, can see good. where to go with group questions. Okay. With all due respect to my fellow yeah. moderator. Can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, congratulations to the Arctic Economic, no, Arctic Council. And I totally support you, Eric. It's, uh, the consensus model should go forward. It should depend on the eight affected countries or main, main participants. You will find through the dialogue, find the balance between economic and environmental development and to do that in a sustainable way. That's very, very important and it's worked well so far. I point out two, uh, two one main topic and, 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 uh, and one area of where one could uh, focus in the future. Of course, it has been mentioned, infrastructure, and it's absolutely clear, infrastructure is absolutely key. That is the catalyst for development. The resources are in the Arctic. Without infrastructure, there will be no development, just like it's been very little for many hundred years. This, that kind of infrastructure <coughs> needs investment, and investment uh, across borders. This means that you need a, a uh, we think, or I, I think we have to develop a platform which can provide that sort of investments in a more a smoother way than today. Today it's very often national, it's very often up to the private party, or possibly the public party, but there is no body or no uh, mechanism which works for the public-private. The sector, very, very important. To, to reach this, it was mentioned that the Arctic uh, Investment Protocol was established uh, to create a consensus about how investors should behave, what kind of projects, how the projects should behave and, and be developed. And also there is a, a goal of developing an Arctic, should we call it permanent investment vehicle, which works according to these uh, uh, guidelines. A public private uh, initiative, and it still needs to find its form, but it's very, very important. <clears throat> what kind of infrastructure could be, um, be uh, financed between Alaska and Norway? Or wh where are the common denominators? There are many. One example is that there has been a project for a floating port in, in uh, Longyearbyen in Svalbard. It's been developed. Exactly the same concepts can, of course, be used in 
Alaska as well, and other places in the Arctic as well. Typical areas where we could uh, cooperate and where building two is much cheaper than building one. Another area has been touched upon. We have to create jobs in the Arctic. Jobs which means that the young people will stay, that there is uh, a future. And one uh, thing which, you know, one aspect of the Arctic is that it's rich in resources, not only oil and gas, but also mineral resources. Those are now being, if they are being developed, they are being extorted uh, independently of each other or as raw materials. By combining those uh, resources, gas and mineral and uh, mineral metals, you can create much higher value products, which would withstand the cyclicality of the markets, especially the commodity markets, much, much better, and thereby creates requirements <coughs> for uh, competent jobs, long term, in fact, environmentally sound, because you use gas instead of coal for, uh, uh, energy, less transportation and so on, and it creates value which stays in the Arctic. I think I will conclude with that. Thank you. And so, uh, where is Tony? Anthony Edwardson. Here, come on up and speak to us very briefly, and then we'll get to questions for everybody. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, uh, Ambassador and Mr. Secretary. I'm Anthony Edwardson, and uh, I think my grandpa had, a, had something very in common uh, when he decided to move to Alaska in the late 1800s. And he came from uh, Mondale, Norway, so he was trying to get Norway connected with Alaska. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to thank you guys for giving the opportunity to be with you guys today. I'm Anthony E. Edwardson, President and CEO of Utkavik Inupiat Corporation, one of the uh, largest village corporations, very successful. And just want to be real brief about what I'm about to share. Utkavik Inupiat Corporation, UIC Anxa Village Corporation for Barrow, Alaska. Barrow is the northernmost community in America, and the home is for over 4,500 people majority of whom are Inupiaq Eskimos. And Tara, I've watched Tara grow up from, from <laughs> there to there. Yeah. UIC consists and rank among the Alaska top 49er companies, and we're one of the largest village corporations, very successful in Alaska. UIC has more than 4,000 employees worldwide, and together as one UIC family of companies, UIC operates in several foreign countries, <coughs> Iraq, Afghanistan, Argentina, Japan, and South Korea. As of February 2016, we're in 169 office projects and locations. UIC's business lines is construction services, professional services, engineering, scientific, and environmental oil and gas support services, marine services, transportation and logistics, UIC land, sand and gravel, UIC operations, commercial, residential, real estate management, and government services. I just want to um, share with you guys how we need to prepare ourselves with the uh, finding partnership with other countries, and I think Norway is one of the one of the key partners that we're looking at. It's uh, I, I think we experienced the, the vast vessel movement that's going from through the Northwest Passage and the Northeast Passage, and we we already have an airport that's very well equipped. It's it's got the highest sophisticated equipment the airport needs. And Barrow is one of the unique places on the top of the world. Where, wherever you go, going across the high Arctic, you got to stop in Barrow. And as, as far as um, what we've been working real hard with um, uh, President Obama and the, uh, the delegates of Alaska, we are very lack of infrastructure. And we've worked really hard with um, Senator Murkowski, Senator Sullivan, and before it was Senator Begich, 
that uh, we try to identify a, a, a safety search and rescue effort for um, the U.S. Coast Guard. And when we saw all the activity going on, that uh, we needed that uh, search and rescue effort. And uh, therefore, we worked really hard on, you know, getting the U.S. Coast Guard in place in Barrow, Alaska. And, you know, because it goes right down to what um, McGuire mentioned about people. And, you know, it's all about search and rescue. And when it comes to the high Arctic, what we've experienced in, in Barrow, we, we see more and more the uh, cruise ships going up through Barrow. And with the cruise ships going through up, up through Barrow, it's, we don't have that search and rescue capabilities. So with that being said, we've been working really hard on putting a deep draft port right there in Barrow. And it's very well protected in a bay. And that's what we've been really advocating for with the uh, U.S. delegates. And, and I think we've made a number of proposals to uh, Arctic Council. The declining in the Arctic sea ice has made the Arctic a more vulnerable strategic option for transportation shipping. Trans-Arctic shipping connect ports to Alaska, Norway, Iceland, Russia, and other Arctic nations. Connect eight Arctic nations to Barrow. Connect to air transportation system. Barrow Airport is one of the most unique airports there is in the top of the world. And Anchorage, Alaska is one of the fourth largest cargo transportation airports in the world. Our Bowhead Transportation Parking Service, Ungalak Landing Craft, provides transportation for um, all the local villages that are on the north, north slope. And with that being said, um, we only receive fuel oil once a year. So once that barge is missed, we have to pay an excessive amount of air transportation to get the fuel into whatever it may be, the villages. And I don't want you to stop, but you've said so many things that are leading me to think of our next two speakers that I'm going to ask you to stop here just so we can right. bring them up and make good use of our remaining 20 minutes because you've led us to thinking of the ships that should go from village to village on our coast yeah. and the ports and dock facilities we need to bring them there. So, okay. first you. of all, thank you. Don't go far away. No. We'll bring up Liv. Please, where did Liv go? Here she is. Come on up and speak very briefly about your thoughts before we bring you into a group discussion. We'll save our tourism master for the last. Thank you, Ali. Uh, my name is Meg Monica Ross, and I work as a legal counselor to a number of businesses working in the Arctic, and I'm a partner in law firm Selmer. I'll respond to your invitation, uh, Alice, to address some of the issues which I think are essential uh, to develop the economic endeavors in the Arctic, which is so clearly prioritized by the Arctic Council as recently as the clear invitation issued in 2013 by the eight Arctic Council member states to get a structured interface and a cooperation space with business under the Arctic Economic Council. So it has been well caught. Tara is running it, Arno is uh, operating it, and the 42 members are addressing how to get predictable and to get interesting business opportunities. I have three points I wanted to share with you. Firstly, there is a sophistication in the Arctic, which I think is underestimated. That means we have a very good stakeholder cooperation already. The indigenous peoples are very much open to dialogue with business, indeed encourages and embraces uh, the opportunity to discuss with all types of businesses how they co can cooperate to make sure that you're building prosperity in the Arctic. Secondly, you will see that you have a very 
predictable and well-known and tested regulation already in place, as the State Secretary referred to initially, the key treaty of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Seas. And of course, you tried very professionally as a moderator to draw the ambassador, but I will, I will mention that the US has said that they think the treaty makes sense and that they will play by its rules. So for us as business people, that's uh, not bad. Um, and I think that the regulatory regime, which is there and which is being taken care of step by step in terms of search and rescue, in terms of oil spill prevention and combating illegal fisheries, which are three issues that have been well covered in cooperation between the coastal states, demonstrate that this is a well-functioning part of the world for business. And my third and uh, last point is I really uh, enjoyed your intervention, Tara, saying maybe we should do things somewhat differently here. Maybe the bridge builders are not the ones that we usually look to, diplomats and governments. Maybe it is business people, maybe it is NGOs, and maybe it is local and re regional politicians that are the practical executors of the will of the people as it is expressed in the commendable treaties made by governments. Thank you. And so this brings us to our last presenter, uh, Daniel from Hurtigruten. I hope I pronounced that right. And I'll come back after you're done telling us briefly how we might cooperate better with some questions of my own. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Arctic, and I lead a company who is lucky enough to be the largest explorer cruise operator in the world, and was also having hotels, uh, sledge dogs, snowmobiles in, in the Arctic. There are massive opportunities for tourism in the Arctic. Massive opportunities. This can be a very important and vital part for creating jobs in the Arctic, but the development needs to be sustainable, it needs to be responsible, and we need to make sure that we leave value creation and money behind in the communities and not take it away from it. So we can create a high value, high quality uh, travel products in the Arctic, experience, nature, authenticity, the potential is enormous, and we should focus on the fact that a good place to visit should also be a good place to live. And we can't jeopardize this by creating these non-authentic Santa villages, as some countries have been doing, or a loving that we receive these huge, enormous cruise ships. The latest one is almost 7,000 people. It's, it's so much larger than the communities they're gonna, gonna visit. And that's jeopardizing the whole strategy to, to develop a sustainable form of tourism. The Obama administration made very strict regulations toward the oil and gas industry in uh, Alaska. We support that. The same should apply for the cruise industry and the travel industry to make sure that we develop this sustainable. My challenge to the Arctic Council, to Alaska, to Norway is to be progressive thinkers, to be in front of the development, to speed up the green shift in policies together and not fade for others. And another challenge I have is to develop, instead of going north-south as we do in the Arctic very often, from the Norwegian Arctic, we go to Oslo. From, the, uh, from Alaska, we go to Washington. So, so let's develop an east-west kind of cooperation. And let me finalize by one example. We have three hotels in Longyearbyen on Svalbard. It's the northernmost community in the world. Uh, our, our hotels were sinking because of the permafrost. Where did we go to find competence for that? We didn't go to Oslo. We didn't go to Europe. We went to Arctic Canada and brought in consultants from a Canadian company that was experts in this. So last challenge, develop this east-west bound commercial opportunities. Thank you. That's, that's the theme, the east-west bond. So, Sterla Henriksen, I, I'd love it if, given your perspective as the global observer of shipping on behalf of Norwegian ship owners, 
help us tie this conversation together in a way that uh, only business people can look at it, which is how do we now begin to stimulate the east-west business, the circumpolar business, and all the spin-offs that should come from it? I give you the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Alice. I think that um, I consider it a fact that the importance of uh, the Arctic is uh, increasing economically and strategically. And I think that the pressure on this region is increasing. And I think that calls for more cooperation, more cooperation between those uh, states represented in the Arctic Council, which I I believe he's sort of the key body here. I want to congratulate uh, the Arctic Council with its uh, 20th uh, anniversary. Uh, I think it's important that we also find other ways of um, uh, cooperating. I think that uh, what Liv uh, Monica uh, mentioned about finding new ways, new uh, constellations of cooperation will be important. I think that there is a need to engage the business community in uh, much more extensive that, uh, than have been done so far, uh, because I think that contributions from the business community have been too random, too fragmented, too uncoordinated. I think that the business community uh, should contribute. It's a moral obligation. I think that the business community has a lot to bring to the table. A lot of experience, uh, a lot of investments which are to be made by the private sector, and also uh, a lot of the technological developments needed for harsh climate operations need to be developed by the business community. So this is uh, important. I think also that it's in the business community's genuine self-interest to do that. We need, in order to expand uh, operations, we need to have a license to operate, and that means that we have to develop trust. And this trust is developed in uh, the relationship, in the cooperation with all the other stakeholders in this, uh, in this region. And for that, uh, that purpose, we have initiated the Arctic uh, Business Council, which is a cross-industry international uh, forum. I think that... Um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, key aspects for further cooperation is to sort of uh, try to agree on what are sort of the main practical steps forward. And I think that on the regulatory side, I think there is uh, uh, more to be done. I think that on development of infrastructure, and in particular on communication and search and rescue capacities. Those should be sort of the priorities for the next steps uh, uh, going forward. And also, I would like to add, and this is with reference to what a representative from Alaska said yesterday, because a lot of us, myself included, talk about the need for a stepwise precautionary approach, sustainable development, responsibility. This is what I say and mean. But uh, the Alaskan representative yesterday, he didn't hear that. He heard overregulation. He heard obstacles to industrial and societal developments. And here I think we have to sort of strike a balance because what we need is to develop this region in a societal and uh, uh, industrial uh, fashion which is uh, sustainable. But also, we know that the pressure exerted on this region, as the ice recedes, as the uh, resources are getting uh, accessible, as new tradeways, new trade lanes are opening up, both regionally and globally, I think that there are a lot of stakeholders who do not share these perspectives. And this is why the circumpolar states, in particular, and the, and the people of the Arctic Council, uh, and the people gathered in this room uh, has a, a particular role to play. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very helpful. Now we have so few minutes left. 
I'd like to pick up on a point, I think it was Tara, perhaps someone else made earlier. We are going to have more meetings where there will be opportunities to continue this kind of discussion. To my knowledge, this is the first discussion I've attended in any way associated with the Arctic Economic Council even, where we're instead of talking about economic policies and public policies, talking about business to business exchange and cooperation. I would like each of you to think about ways we can build this into future gatherings. Future gatherings anywhere that the government representatives cause the private sector to join them in gathering. Once we're there, let's split off the public sector conversations from the private and talk about the areas which make the most sense for actually putting investment ideas on a table, so to speak, and seeing if there are participants who might be interested in developing joint ventures. The first one I can see, which is so obvious given what uh, you all are thinking about in Norway, is the subject of sustainable alternative green energy that is specifically tailored for the climate of the Arctic. It is insane to be looking to, to the south, as people say, when we up here have very specific geographic needs that are different. And so I would put that out there as the first. Uh, Arnie, I would invite you now as my co-moderator to suggest how we might bring about other tangible suggestions for how we take this conversation and build on it at another gathering with these same sorts of participants. That's a good thought. I don't think we have two minutes left, so why don't we let the political representative respond to what they heard about the demands from the business people over here. So, Tura, what is your response so far? Well, and how could we, as Ali say, take this further on. Yeah, just, you know, very brief, some reflections. And I, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of, a lot of things have been said, but I think it needs to be repeated. One thing, I've, several have pointed out that, you know, the Arctic, you know, there was a term a couple of years ago about the race to Arctic, as if this was a kind of uh, all people fighting to sort of get to the Arctic and tap resources. But it's actually a low tension area. It is actually a well-regulated area, partly because, as Liv Monica said, because of the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the rights of obligations of coastal states. And all the, the sea areas are actually covered by coastal states, and they have rights and obligations. So this is well-regulated, low-tension area. And that is a good sort of circumstances for private sector activities. I think that's important to, to, uh, to stress. Uh, and also, the, uh, I, I don't think it's been mentioned so far, but I, one of the good things with, uh, with the, uh, the King's visit to Alaska and the foreign minister was the establishment of the University Corporation. As I see it, you know, for, uh, for further development in Norway, a lot of the businesses that will be established in the future will actually come from, you know, ideas will come from research institutions attached to universities, universities. And I think that that strong university cooperation, higher education cooperation between Alaska and Norway can be good in the sense that that will create bigger opportunities for joint venture, as Alice is pointing out. And, and on, you know, I'm not a sort of specialist on businesses, but certainly, you know, I would strongly support Alice's appeal to actually see if what is possible to come to, to flesh out these for joint ventures now. Thank you very much, Tour. Mr. Ambassador, is, do you think it's important to bring this further on, this kind of cooperation and discussion? Absolutely. I think we've heard lots of very constructive uh, suggestions and insights uh, as to how we go forward, and that's uh, what we all, I think, want to do and should do and will do. Thank you very much. And from what I still call the local politicians, even you are a member of the parliament, how do you summarize? How do you take this further on in the uh, in your parliament, Eric? I think uh, Tara Sweeney said the key word, commitment. Uh, we have met here in Norway to discuss possibilities. Uh, I think we should commit to uh, together look into common interest projects in, in the future and take uh, Alice uh, uh, Pray for a meeting again and discussing this further. Thank you very much. And we go, Alaska, you go to the last board here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one thing that was good is that many of the 
discussion points from the political side were similar to things that people in the business sector had to say. And so I think that's good that our worlds aren't um, too disconnected. Um, I think uh, future dialogue is important. And I, I would say that as we look to future dialogue, to me, the common theme is infrastructure, <coughs> financing, access to capital, um, communication between uh, small and larger companies, technological advances and new ways of thinking, uh, and innovation. And I think um, as we move into the next series of dialogues, it might be nice to have some of the discussions um, even more pinpointed so that people can come in prepared to discuss what they've been able to do as far as um, infrastructure and where the remaining challenges are, where they see the need for innovation and new markets, um, and how they're faring in, in getting large and small corporations together. Thank you very much. And one place where we could continue this, Alice, is in the Alaskan-based Alaskan Dispatch mm -hmm. and Norwegian-based High North News, where we are discussing these issues on a daily basis, and we will continue with that. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I hope that when we next gather, we will be laying plans for an Arctic Business Expo. Mm -hmm. That's my dream. So someday in the future, we'll do it with but lots of booths and trade shows around. Thank you, participants. <laughs>